Welcome to The Rational Egoist. I'm your host, Michael Leibowitz. As long as I've been paying attention to politics, I've been hearing that America is going the way of the Roman Empire, and people frequently try to draw similarities and comparisons between the two. So when I came across an article recently claiming that the better comparison would be with the Roman Republic, I knew I had to try to get the author of the article on, so I reached out, and he's here with us today. He's a playwright, screenwriter, author, and journalist. He graduated from Yale University with a Bachelor of Arts degree in history. Jonathan Leaf, welcome to The Rational Egoist. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So I guess the best place to start would be with the Roman Republic. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Well, it was very long lasting. It lasted almost as long as the, the empire did. And we talked about the empire, uh, meaning the Western Empire, the one that included Rome. Um, it lasted for almost 500 years from uh, 509 BC to some people say 27 BC. Some people say 29 BC that Augustus really claimed that the, he actually never claimed the title of emperor, but effectively was emperor. Um, so it lasted for almost 500 years, very long lasting. It went through various transformations. Um and it conquered an enormous, enormous territory. Um, most of what we think of as the Roman Empire was actually captured by the Republic. Uh, and it became increasingly unstable uh, towards the end, despite its vast conquests. In fact, uh, really because of its, to a great extent, because of its conquests. Um, and some of the issues that we're seeing in the United States today bear some parallel with some of the issues that exist in the Roman Republic. And we hope I would say I think all of us hope that uh, we're not headed in the direction of an end to representative government. But, of course, that's actually what happened uh, to Rome. So what happened that I mean, you mentioned that it, basically it was spread too thin with all these conquests. But what ultimately led to its fall and its transition into the empire? Well, there were a whole bunch of things. One is that, uh, ironically, they got so rich, um, which, of course, is an issue with the United States today. Uh, today but. When they conquered all these different places, they took vast numbers of slaves. They also uh, pillaged and they took uh, natural resources, gold, silver, and other things. But they they took a lot of slaves. I mean, just in the conquest of Gaul under Julius Caesar at one point, I think it was a single week that they took 650,000 people as slaves who were then sold. And these uh, conquests produced a vast amount of wealth. So some people got very, very rich. and they came to rely more and more on these slaves. Um, so they went from a, a society that was composed of small farmers, uh, uh, some kind of Jeffersonian ideal, I suppose, to one where there were very, very rich people who had great numbers of slaves and servants. And there were a lot of people who were desperately poor, in fact, actually partly because of the conquest. So among the places that they conquered uh, in, in the second century BC, or I guess it was right around 200 BC, they conquered Sicily. Sicily is an extremely productive agricultural region. It's not that it doesn't get that much uh, rainfall, but it's a volcanic island. Um, so it produces a lot of grain. And then later, uh, during Caesar's lifetime, they captured Egypt, which is just incredibly productive because of the Nile River. So they suddenly started getting these very cheap sources of foreign grain. And, small, and, and some of that happened even before when they conquered Spain and various other places. And suddenly they had this large quantity of cheap food and small farmers were left destitute. They couldn't compete with bigger farmers who had slaves. They couldn't compete with uh, these foreign sources of grain. And vast numbers of them went to the big cities, Rome especially. And they went on the dole. And they had this incredible expansion of welfare, which they could pay for because suddenly they had all these conquered provinces and places they could tax. And by the time of Julius Caesar, Rome was the first city in the world that had a million people. Over 300,000 of those people were on welfare. Uh, and the term they used, as I, I mentioned in the article, um, which originally appeared in Law and Liberty, plug for Law and Liberty, uh, was mobile vulgus, which uh, we use from that that we get the word mob. They were basically a mob and politicians would promise them handouts. And they would attach themselves to these politicians and threaten other people in the city who were attached to other politicians. And there was kind of a breakdown in civil order because of this, that maybe more reminiscent of what happened in uh, Germany before the Nazis took over, where, you know, there were there were factions who were uh, that were uh, Nazi and there were factions that were communist and they're beating each other up in the streets of Berlin. It was a little bit like that. 
And so there was a lot of civil disorder because you suddenly had a lot of people who were just dependent on welfare. They didn't actually have any income uh, or any work, any regular work. So it sounds like a big reason that the Republic came to an end, the Republic of Rome, is that it was a situation where there were a lot of people working and also a lot of people not working. And the people who weren't yeah. working were dependent on those who were. Yeah. And a lot of the rich were super rich, which is, I guess, sort of something we find distressing about the present moment. So even someone like Cicero, I guess if you pronounce Latin correctly, supposedly now they're saying it's Cicero. But uh, Cicero had like a, a thousand slaves. I mean, there were, they were, there were people who were extremely rich. Uh, and there was a huge growth in finance as a business uh, with, you know, people borrowing huge amounts of money to buy slaves, to sell slaves, uh, to buy land in these in these conquered territories. And all this was very destabilizing. Uh, and the army itself went through a series of transformations. So, um, you know, originally the army was something really for the aristocrats or for landowners. Uh, and they were called up in time of military need. And eventually it became this, they, they had a huge standing army of paid soldiers who were basically mercenaries. Um, so th there was a real transformation in, in uh, their social structure. So at some point they, they transitioned to the empire. So you said the right. empire la lasted, they, they roughly lasted the same uh, amount of time. So how long did the Roman empire last? The, the empire, well, how long? Depends. If, let's say if we date it, yeah, if we date it from 27 BC to 27 BC, usually given, it's usually given as ending the Western Empire in 476 AD. So a little more than 500 years. I mean, it's a little bit of an arbitrary date. And, and Constantinople and the Byzantine Empire, which was at least considered itself a Roman Empire, though they spoke Greek and, you know, was sort of a different society in a lot of ways. Um, that continued uh, all the way up to 1453. So that continued almost another thousand years beyond that. And what was life like for your average person during the empire? In a lot of ways, pretty, pretty terrible. I mean, we talk about the, um, you know, the Pax Romana, but the reality is that life was very harsh. A lot of people were slaves or something akin to, to serfs. They lived on these big estates called Latifundia, and their condition was often close to serfdom. A lot of the there were, they had a lot of slaves in places like Egypt, and many of them died very young. They were basically worked to death. There were people who were in mines were worked to death. Um, you know, there was very little freedom. Uh, at some point, they they took to uh, particularly under Diocletian, they started worshiping not only worshiping the emperor as a god, but even practicing things like prostration. You know, where you kiss the emperor's feet. Um, and, and you, you know, to practice Christianity for very long periods, really up until uh, just before Constantine, was punishable by death. Um, if you did it openly and you, you avowed that you were a Christian, um, you know, it was a lot of ways, you know, they, they invaded Palestine uh, multiple times and killed hundreds of thousands of Jews um, in response to Jewish nationalism. Um, you know, they did a lot of really uh, vicious and terrible things, which they celebrated. I mean, they would have these so-called triumphs in Rome where people saw um, captured slaves and, you know, uh, war booty and everyone would applaud this. Uh, I, I guess we all know about they had these uh, uh, circuses uh, where there were, you know, was butchery took place. Um, you know, a lot of ways is a very harsh uh, society to live in. And what ultimately, I mean, I know there's a lot of things that caused it, but what are some of the main things that ultimately brought the empire to its knees, that, that brought it down? Well, there are many things. I mean, they had a, a, one thing is they had a very low birth rate. So the population of the empire uh, declined from about 70 million under Augustus when it was kind of, it was it began to about 50 million at its end. So uh, uh, they actually had a population decline. That's one thing. They repeated plagues. Um, they had uh, serious problems with inflation and caused by debasement of the currency and also by uh they also and then they tried to deal with inflation under diocletian by instituting price controls and the price controls led to famine and uh, depopulation of the cities you know a lot of the same sorts of problems that you associate with price controls historically uh and because people got to be emperor basically by paying off their troops uh and then fighting other people who wanted to be emperor other generals um, there were constant civil wars, and every time there was a civil war, troops would be taken from the border and there'd be barbarian invasions on the Rhine, on the Danube, 
uh, along the border with uh, Persia. So they had a lot of different problems. And, and also in the Western Empire, at some point, almost everyone who made up the uh, army, they call them federati, were, um, were actually people who, whose first language wasn't Latin. They were people who barbarians who basically come and settled in the empire, and they didn't necessarily have that much allegiance to the empire. So you say they had inflation. Now, we have inflation in America today, uh, but what was the inflation like during the period that you're talking about? Much more extreme. I mean, for instance, during the third century and the fourth century, there were periods when they had 35% inflation a year or more. Uh, they think in the third century as a whole that prices increased more than 100 times. So, you know, this is much, much greater inflation. Than, it might not be what we, you know, the kind of hyperinflation you think of in terms of Argentina or, not, you know, or, or uh, Weimar Germany or something, but it was it was very extreme inflation, much, much, much more than what we've had. So, you know, you say that they tried to deal with inflation with price controls, and we've had some experience with that. Well, I didn't have, I wasn't, I don't think they born yet. No, I wasn't, matter of fact, but where they tried to deal with inflation through price controls. It, so why isn't that an apt comparison? In other words, why do you think that it's a better comparison between modern America and the Roman Republic rather than the empire? Well, the society and the empire was totally unlike our society. I mean, you have vast numbers of slaves. You have, um, uh, you know, emperors who worship. Do we worship the president as a god? No. I mean, the the everything was run by the by the army uh, and the Praetorian Guard specifically often played a huge role. Uh, just last week, you may notice in the news, the president didn't know where the defense secretary was for for a whole week. He came out. Yeah. Well, you know, yes. I mean, this is totally opposite to the United States, where we have absolute civilian control of the military to such an extent that the president doesn't even know where the head of the military <laughs> is, and he doesn't seem to care. Now that may be an indictment of Biden, but. Uh, you know, totally different kind of societies. The the army is is very much under civilian control. We don't have uh, soldiers getting paid vast sums to support the latest pretender to the throne. Um, Christians aren't being uh, executed for uh, saying that they're Christians. Um, you know, it's a it's a it's a totally different kind of society. But the republic, some of the issues that exist in the republic, and led to its collapse. You know, great inequality. Um, among rich and poor, people on welfare, um, expansion of imperial responsibility or, or army responsibilities to, to, to distant places. Um, these, I think you'd say there are at least some things that sound familiar. Why are people more prone to compare us to the empire rather than the republic? I mean, is it, it, like the, the first thing that just came in my head is, well, the empire is far more known than was the republic but i'd imagine there has to be other reasons than just that so what are some of the reasons behind this well i think a lot of us they just don't know any they don't actually know the history that they're writing about they want to write about history but they know very little about it but i also think there's some element of their perception and particularly among the intelligentsia in this country there's this perception that america is is, is bad and decadent and violent and they associate those things with the empire. So they think, well, gee, we're just like the empire, but no, we're really not. The empire was something completely different. It, it didn't, obviously, well, just at the most simplest level, it didn't have representative government. Um, the government regularly stole from the richest people. Um, you know, it, it just they're just things that just aren't similar at all. Are there any other, in, in your view, any other famous empires or nation states that have fallen uh, that had situations before their fall that are similar to what we have in America? I mean, like national debt, for instance, and national debt, uh, a lot of people on government programs, that sort of uh, military bases throughout the world. Well, I think, uh, you know, obviously Great Britain after, in the aftermath of World War II, you know, they were very indebted. They had uh, all these overseas responsibilities, which were very expensive. I mean, that's one of the reasons that they... You know, we, we talk about decolonization, but one of the reasons that they, you know, gave up all these uh, colonies they had in Africa and other places was it was expensive. You know, it was expensive. They they it, it, they weren't making money out, out of these possessions. They were they were costing them money. So they finally walked out, but they still were left with all this debt. 
and they had an intellectual class that was very socialist, very influenced by the Labor Party and Fabian Ideas. And uh, of course, that created a lot of problems. We do have a lot of young people in this country who take socialism seriously, often don't really understand what it is, but they think it's it's something positive, And that's a potential risk that we, we face, too. But the growth of welfare in our country is, I think, something that's similar to to the ancient Roman Republic and, and obviously highly problematic. Now, obviously, right now we've got a very divided country. We've got on, on one side, they want to just keep increasing the socialism and they. So I should say I don't want to I shouldn't say socialism. I say socialistic policies because I, I like to be precise. Uh, you also have this the wokeism on the left, the diversity, equity, inclusion uh, crowd, and then on the right we have a complete, you know, almost a complete distrust in traditional institutions, uh, you know, media uh, claims of uh, elections being stolen. It, it's right. difficult even to assess what's truth and what isn't at this point. Are there any anything from history that you know of that is reminiscent of that, or is this sui generis what we have going on here? Yeah, it's a tough question. Uh, uh, I guess you can probably make lots of comparisons. I mean, the, the degree of division in the country is is kind of unusual in terms of American history, in that, uh, you know, if you compare European countries to the United States, they've just historically had many more voters voting for extreme parties, uh, you know, whether it's a communist, socialist, uh, or fascist. And we really haven't had that. And we still, you know, the overwhelming majority of the votes are going to Democrats, Democrats and Republicans. But it does seem there's more of a divide uh, ideologically between the two parties in a way that is, you know, uncharacteristic of American politics and probably haven't seen in you know, since at least the Great Depression or or maybe even the populist era, uh, which was also, by the way, uh, the populist era was also a period of, of great economic inequality. And to some extent, the Great Depression was as well. So maybe that's maybe that's playing a big a big part in it. Now, you're in, in the arts, you're a playwright also, and you're also yep. an author. So yep. in terms of tastes in art, I mean, culture culturally is the united states today similar to the republic of rome or, or to the empire of rome or anywhere else where the just the type of the type of novels that are written or the type of movies television programs that are obviously our cultural institutions in that regard when it comes to at least the visual and the recording arts are highly left wing and I, I, a lot of folks think that that's a problem I, i'm one of them, uh, but I don't. That, that's not to say I think that it'd be better off if, if the right was dominating these things. I just think we'd be better off with something more along the lines of a romantic realism. But it, it, that's neither here nor there. I just wanted to be clear with that. I'm, I'm not coming out in favor of right wing dominance of, of our media institutions or art institutions. But was there a decline in the either the Roman Republic or the Roman Empire in terms of taste in in art and the types of art that people were into well most of what you know people think today was important from roman times artistically uh either came from the late republic or or even earlier in the republic up into the up up through the period of augustus um and a lot of the people were significant artistically were people were actually born before augustus but but lived during the period of the first emperor uh, and they actually call it the Augustan age because it was, you know, that's the period of Virgil and Horace and a lot of the other people are considered most important in, in uh, Roman literature. Uh, a lot of the stuff that came after, not so much the history, but a lot of the stuff that came after was not considered as good. And of course, Byzantine art and architecture, I don't, I don't think in general is considered to be uh, uh, very imaginative or creative or, or of high standards of excellence. So it seems like they they kind of reached an apogee during the period, the end of the Republic and the very beginning of the empire. And then it just declined, which makes sense because the society was increasingly totalitarian after that. Would you say that there was a more flourishing cultural life, both in the Republic and the empire before Constantine made Christianity, the official religion of the empire or afterwards? Gee, I don't know. I think, I think it really deteriorated by the time, 
you know, the, the Roman emperors are usually divided into into groups. So um, Augustus Augustus was emperor until um, I think some was it uh, was it fifteen A.D. something like that when he when he died and was replaced by Tiberius, his adoptive son. Um, so he, they call it the Julio uh, uh, Claudian family. So this family of people who start the line starts with Julius Caesar, uh, Octavian, or Augustus was his nephew and adoptive son. And there were a whole group of emperors uh, up through Nero who were related either by blood or marriage to Julius Caesar. And except for Augustus, they were mostly terrible rulers. They were horrible, terrible rulers. And included in that is Caligula. You know, we all know the story that he supposedly slept with his sister and he nominated his horse for, to be consul. And Nero was a complete lunatic. And, you know, I don't know if we're to believe the story that he burned down Rome or, you know, uh, the, but the persecution of the Christians that took place under him was pretty horrific. Um, they were, you know, some of them were actually seen to have been crazy and psychotic. Um, and then they had a period called the Five Good Emperors, all of whom were picked uh they picked them based on, uh, not based on blood relation, but the preceding emperor tried to find somebody he thought was competent and able and stable. And that line uh, ends with Marcus Aurelius, who picked his son Commodus. And if people have seen the movie Gladiator, Commodus is the Joaquin Phoenix character. So he's another sadistic, crazy person. Um, then there were a group of rulers called the Severans who were okay, at least by Roman standards. And then things got really crazy with civil war and violence and, you know, any usurper trying to, and there's actually a period, like 20, there are 26 emperors in like 35 years or something, because there, there were multiple emperors at different times and the empire split up into three at one point. Um, and then things stabilized a little bit with Diocletian and Constantine. I would say that throughout, certainly from the time of Nero onwards, there's very good, there's very little that's that's considered of high quality, except some histories that was written. So to say it got worse under Constantine, no, I think it was just bad. You know, this was not a period of creativity or good expression. Um, you know, Augustus is considered the last great figure where there are major, major artistic figures. Many of them, as I say, born before he was, came of age before he was, but lived during his time. And the empire as a whole produced less afterwards. Um, Actually, I should say something. I, I, I'm Jewish. I'm not Christian. But in defense of um, the Christian role in the empire, there was a there's a famous uh, you probably know British historian uh, Edward Gibbon who wrote *The Decline Fall of the Roman Empire*, which was very influential. Um, it's 18, 18th series of books written in the 18th century. Actually, the first volume came out in uh, the year of the American Revolution, 1776, and he promoted the idea that Christianity had weakened the empire and that it played a role in its fall. But we, actually, all the evidence suggests just the opposite. Um, the parts of Italy that fell to the uh, barbarian tribes most rapidly were the parts that were the most pagan. And Italy, the Italian peninsula itself, was very still very pagan at the time that it collapsed. Uh, the eastern part of the empire, which was overwhelmingly Christian, had the highest rates of volunteerism. And that's the part that remained, uh, <clears throat> that didn't fall to barbarian tribes and actually survived for another thousand years. And how about in terms of speaking of religion, of philosophy in religion, how does the Republic compare to the empire? And it, it, like, what, what were the major philosophical schools, the major religions that were practiced, that, that sort of thing? Well, you know, they were very influenced by the Greeks and they were, you know, they were full of admiration for the Greeks. So they're, you know, they're, uh, their gods are, you know, they're arguably imitative of the Greek gods. You know, Zeus becomes uh, Jupiter and uh, um, Athena becomes Minerva and Hera becomes Juno. It's, and, you know, Poseidon becomes Neptune. And they also were very influenced by Greek philosophical schools. And it was not unusual if you were rich Roman and you wanted to be uh, edu quote unquote ed educated or give yourself a certain area of cultivation to go to Greece and to study at Plato's Academy in Greek. So this was not an unusual thing. So, you know, schools like Stoicism, obviously Stoicism had a huge impact uh, on the Roman Republic and to some extent, even on some of the Marcus Aurelius famously on the Roman emperors. What innovations legally came out of the, uh, I, I believe that there were more innovations legal in terms of law that came out of the empire, but I, I could be mistaken. So, but what type of what, what I guess what I want to know is what type of parallels in terms of the legal system is there between modern America and 
both the empire and the republic. Well, you know, at the, at the beginning of the Renaissance, uh, really, even the, the end of the Middle Ages, people went back and they started looking at Roman legal codes for instruction and guidance and, you know, inspiration, uh, because many of them survived. So people started studying them as well as they studied Justinian's code from the Byzantine Empire. And um, but, our, of course, our, our, our own legal system has um, Anglo-Saxon um it's an Anglo-Saxon inheritance. So it's not based on statute law. It's based on common law. You, you probably know more about this than I do. Uh, I'm not an attorney. But, Neither am um, I. <laughs> except, for, yeah. Well, it sounds like you had some, some so you had to deal with some legal issues in the, in the past. So, but except for Louisiana, Louisiana is the only uh, state in the, in the country that doesn't use common law. Yes, yes, I, I believe you're correct. Yeah, their, their law is based on the Roman civil law, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. So what I'm going to put on your Nostradamus hat. Uh, how, where do you think America's he headed? Are, are we headed for a fall significantly uh, similar to that of the Republic? Uh, is there a chance that we could rise like a phoenix out of the ashes and hit our, our, our previous glory or maybe a new glory? What do you think? What are the prospects? Gee, you know, I really don't know. I'm not, a, I will say this, I'm not a pessimist, but sometimes I've been... Uh... Uh, able to see the future and sometimes not at all. You know, my fa my father uh, started using the internet and my father's been dead for many years. We started using the internet. And I remember in like 1983 or 1984, he's showing me, he was an academic and he's showing me that he, you know, he could send messages to people by email and thinking, what's the point of this? <laughs> what a waste of time. So obviously I, didn't, I missed that one. I worked, uh, you know, I have this career as a playwright. I've had many plays produced, and some of them have gotten wonderful reviews, so I'll just give a little plug in now for me, um, including one one of my plays a few years ago was picked by the Wall Street Journal as one of the four best plays of the world uh, in the world that year. It was 2018. Uh, I was nominated for Best Off-Broadway Play of the Year in 2006, et cetera. Uh, so I've gotten wonderful, and audiences have loved. A lot of my plays have sold out, and, you know, et cetera. And I recently, oh, I recently had a, not, again, plug myself by me. Uh, I had a novel that came out in March that people probably really enjoyed. It's a mystery novel set in Los Angeles. And Kirkus, which is famously difficult as reviewers, said it was, quote, light literary, light literary entertainment at its best. So people should look for it. It's called City of Angles. But anyway, I, I haven't always been able to support myself as a writer. So in 2007 and 2008, I was working uh, as a corporate writer at Bear Stearns, the investment bank. I had no idea there was a financial crisis brewing. None whatever. So my prognostications have sometimes been so wildly, um, it's not even they've been wrong. I just haven't seen the future. So, you know, you know, I don't, I don't claim they necessarily understand what's going to come next, but I'm not a pessimist. Um, I think the fact that people are so unhappy about some of the things we're talking about, about, um, you know, about uh, great, great inequality produced by, you know, things like massive immigration of, of uh, low skilled workers uh, reliance on imports from China, things like that, that people are unhappy is a sign that, uh, you know, things may change, that politicians may wake up. They may be concerned enough about their job and their pension, and they may may do things about this. I, I could be wrong. I could be wrong. I don't know. You know, I got to tell you, you mentioned earlier the pronunciation of Kikoro. <laughs> and while I know, because I looked this up, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago, that the correct pronunciation is Kikoro. It sounds ridiculous to me. It just looks like Cicero. and There's, there's no getting around that in my mind. So do you think we missed anything uh, that, that's relevant to your thesis and the article that you wrote? Anything that you want to add to the discussion before we wrap up? No, this is not relevant, but taking even further what you just said, you know, uh, there are people now who insist that Vini Vidi Viki was Weeny Weedy Weeki. <laughs> it's not the same. <laughs> no, it, it doesn't. It, it doesn't carry the same oomph. <laughs> no, I agree. All right. So, where can people find you? Where can they find your writings, your books, everything? <laughs> well, I have a website. Um, it's Jonathan Leaf L E A F, um, and I also have a Substack that people actually seem to be reading. It's amazing to me, and I, I even. I'm astonished to discover I just started a few weeks ago at the behest of my publisher and already I've got lots of paid subscribers. I don't, I don't know if they're foolish or kind or some combination thereof. Um, but uh, yeah, Jonathan Leaf, uh, just look uh, Google and you can probably find a website and the Substack. And 
you know, I'd be grateful if people would uh, look at either both or uh, I think City of Angles people have really enjoyed. We've gotten good feedback from from readers and from reviewers. Um, thank you for having me on the show. Um, it seems like you have such a you have such terrific guests, and I'm flattered that you asked me. And um, I hope people found this interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thanks for being here. And for now, this is the Rational Eagle with signing out. This is Michael Leibowitz. Remember, tell me what you think of the episode, your likes, your dislikes, your comments. I want it all. They help. Till next time.